Welcome everyone, good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as is our custom, each of our learning forums starts with an acknowledgement of our collective history um, as a step towards reconciliation and a constant reminder of our intentions, purpose, and goals for why we're coming together. In order to address centuries of collective harm and trauma to African-American and indigenous people, we must make an intentional choice to rebuild communities in an equitable manner. I acknowledge living and working on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Chumash, Gabrielino, Tongva, and Fernandeño Tatavian peoples, who are the rightful owners of the land we now call the San Fernando Valley. I also want to acknowledge and pay our respects to the many ancestors uh, whose enslaved forced labor um, they had to endure for this country's development and economic progress. We highly encourage everyone to do their own research uh, on these aspects of our history, and we've got resources on our resource page for you to learn more. Right. So our intention for the learning series, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, has been to create opportunities for counties, tribes, to learn from subject matter experts and to begin to engage one another in the chat, in our discussions about how to create a, a comprehensive prevention infrastructure. Um, another intention is to start to support folks to strengthen cross-sector relationships. Um, we've got child welfare here, juvenile justice, behavioral health, education, community-based providers. Um, we want to be able to position folks to examine their current capacities to effectively partner um, both across agencies and with communities, parents and youth with lived experience. Um, and we have intentionally anchored our series, starting with race equity as the through line and at primary prevention, and then we've extended downstream from there. Uh, but we want to always have the social determinants of health uh, and healthy communities at the forefront of our minds. Today's topic is part two um, of funding primary and secondary prevention strategies. And before I go into our goals for today, I want to acknowledge um, a really, really smart and knowledgeable group of presenters we have um, for you today uh, on this panel. We've got Alex Briscoe, who's a principal at the California Children's Trust, Chris Stoner Mertz, who's the CEO of the California Alliance of Children Family Services and the Associated uh, Training and Technical Assistance Organization, the Catalyst Center. We've got Heather Waters, here with us, who's the Director of Complex Children and Family Services for the Inland Empire Health Plan. Chris Williams uh, from Sacramento County Office of Education. He's the Director of the School-Based Mental Health and Wellness. And uh, moderating our panel today uh, will be Richard Connect, um, who, has, who has been faculty on this learning series often. Um, he, is an integrated services advisor for CDSS. And I, you have me already. Um, I'll moderate the, I'll transition us from section to section uh, and moderate the Q&A at the end. Okay, so in part one, we began this conversation about design and application of funding strategies to maximize the planning you've done to create comprehensive prevention plans and what you're gonna to have to do to implement those plans. We were aiming to, in the presentations, to establish a connection between effective sustainable funding for those comprehensive prevention strategies and parallel prevention opportunities um, that exist uh, we, we highlighted the opportunities that existed uh, in the Medicaid system. Uh, and we highlighted that our system of care work, um, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, um, as the structure that can hold these opportunities between parallel, uh, parallel systems. We wanted to start to get you aware of some of the critical 
um, and significant uh, behavioral health funding opportunities and reforms that can support the success of uh, the implementation of our comprehensive prevention plans. And we wanted to set the stage for today, um, the panel presentation um, on these, these critical concepts and strategies. So no one has figured out how to do this perfectly. We don't have a canned example for you that went from beginning to end, got great outcomes, and we, we've got a shining example of a, a, an initiative that was funded uh, across agencies and is delivering services to children and families. Okay? This is uncharted territory. And what you'll hear from some of our panelists is that it requires some risk tolerance. It requires some tolerance of missteps and reworks along the way. It requires a willingness to learn the hard lessons. Um, but we've got to start somewhere. Um, FFPS funding, Family First Prevention Services funding, especially the state block grant, uh, not intended to be the whole enchilada. Or, or stand alone. In fact, many of you have told me it's not enough. Um, it's intended to get you to the party with something to contribute, is the way I think about it. From the CalAIM standpoint, which you'll hear more about, it's a $10 billion party. So child welfare and probation funds are a sliver of that. We could feel, we could feel bad about that or we could see how those funds could strategically augment other parallel initiatives, and we can customize those. We can request customizations to those with our funding um, for children and families that are shared by all the systems. Our panel is gonna illustrate the types of conversations that are to be had at the party. But before that, I'm just gonna give you a very, very brief refresher on the key messages from part one. Okay, so we actually, right before we went into this two-parter, we were talking about building community pathways. Community path, what we mean by community pathways are pathways where a particular community can access services with as little or no contact with deep end systems as possible. Why are we talking about funding primary and secondary strategies? Well, if we want the probation and child welfare systems to be as absent as possible from families being connected to services, this is the area of prevention to build out. At the tertiary level, they're already at the door of the system. If we wanna divert families from the door of these deep end systems, we're gonna have to be able to provide protective supports and services universally in targeted communities to families who have been put at risk. They're not at risk, they have to been put at risk and subjected to toxic stress. Most of these families are, um, and Alex Briscoe never fails to remind us, are or could be Medi-Cal beneficiaries. They are black, brown, and poor. That system, that Medi-Cal system is where we might look to and bring our funding to a very large $10 billion party so we can support the families uh, and divert them from the doors of our systems. So some images to bring back the conversation from part one. Many of the same factors prevent both child maltreatment, juvenile justice involvement, and poor health outcomes. And those are the social determinants of health. Child welfare and probation are seeking upstream prevention strategies and funds. Medicaid is increasingly addressing those social determinants of health. We know all the systems are coming to realize that poverty, racism, and systemic absence of access to supports and care are key drivers of entry into all government systems, including child welfare and probation. And the Medicaid system is thinking about it in three buckets. Those three buckets are here at the bottom right hand. And two of them are 100% relevant to the conversation today. Upstream prevention, just providing children, youth, and families in community, meeting them where they are, literally, um, with access to services and supports to meet their emerging needs as they emerge, as they walk through life. 
and using intensive evidence-based services um, to provide those services and supports. The third bucket is tailored services for children in foster care, which is relevant, um, but that's what we're trying to prevent here. Everybody's going to have to take on some new roles if this is going to work. Child welfare and probation are going to have to start to move beyond the policing frame uh, that has been traditionally entrusted to them and embrace a new place as a community-based intervention provider, as a community supporter, rather than a community investigator or a community reporter. Uh, and in California and other places, all key cogs in the prevention ecosystem are increasingly outside child welfare and the justice system. Um, they're in schools, they're in, they're in the behavioral health system. The Medicaid has become an essential and under leveraged financing strategy for families at risk of entering child welfare and probation and must be reimagined and transformed to let go. It's had some transformations to do too. It's over medicalization of what might be um, otherwise basic needs. Things like doing away with medical necessity um, as the key to unlock services. Right, so new roles for everyone, um, but we just can't, we cannot ignore the fact that 85% of children who were detained, according to Chapin Hall, were eligible for Medicaid at the time of removal, right? 85%, that's most of them. So some key takeaways I want you to have in mind as you start to listen to our panel is that this is an, ex while it's complex and there's a lot coming at us and the tectonic plates are shifting under us, there is an extraordinary opportunity right now to transform children and family services in partnership with the Medi-Cal mental health delivery system in California. The, the stars are aligning, okay? We have some structures available to us for interagency collaboration with the, um, with the support of AB 2083 and the interagency leadership teams that AB 2083 has had jurisdictions form. Mentioned before, this is unprecedented level of investment, $10 billion in the Medicaid side, but there's a shifting payer landscape to negotiate. And who's now in that landscape that traditionally child welfare and probation haven't um, been talking to? Schools and the managed care plans. Um, who, are, who are the avenue for many of the Medicaid and Medi-Cal benefits uh, that would support families um, as we're diverting them from child welfare and probation. Uh, so you're gonna hear from those folks on our panel today. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over uh, to Richard Connect uh, to moderate the panel, but Richard and Alex, if there's anything else you'd like to highlight and bring forward from part one, please feel free to do that. Um, Otherwise, over to you, Richard. Thanks, Kush. Alex, uh, anything uh, come to mind about part one? You're good to go? All right, fantastic. Kush, really appreciate your uh, framing of these opportunities and challenges. Uh, really nicely done. Uh, as you were uh, sharing uh, your thoughts on this, um, it just uh, really crystallized for me that identifying new sustainable dollars for prevention and early intervention uh, from a, a long list of initiatives and opportunities is really difficult work, uh, lots of complexities. Uh, this reform work is never easy, and uh, we have often in California fallen short for a host of reasons, and it just really, I think, catalyzes the need for adaptive leadership, which can strive collectively for integrated, highly collaborative structures and functions, uh, probably our most significant need, and I suspect as the panel uh, gets into its conversation today, we'll hear uh, that among a, a, number, a number of themes. While it's complicated work, I would, for our attendees, um, invite a moment or two of reflection back on our shared history here in California. Um, we did not think, for instance, in 1998 that we could uh, reduce the number of foster youth uh, by 50% over a 15-year period, and yet we've accomplished that as a state. 10 years ago, before the continuum of care reforms, we, uh, we knew it would be hard to deliver child and family teaming to every foster youth in the state. And while we're early in that process and there have been hiccups 
uh, and questions around the quality of that work, we are now, we think, um, delivering some kind of a teaming process uh, rooted in wraparound research to um, virtually every foster youth. We knew it would be hard to, to send 95% of our justice involved youth back to their communities under Senate Bill 823. Um, but as a state, we've, we've done all of those things and more. And so persistent uh, collective impact uh, with a tenacious leadership makes those things possible. 2023 uh, and move, moving forward, looking forward really represents the, a tsunami of opportunity. And while today we'll focus on a number of things, we won't be able to hit all those opportunities. We, we hope that, um, that some of the opportunities to connect some of the uh, ability to connect those opportunities will be present in our, our conversations as we go forward. We're gonna focus on um, some new workforce opportunities. We're gonna focus on some new care coordination and the, the concrete supports that come with things like enhanced case management. Um, we're gonna focus a little bit on the new mental health benefits uh, that are gonna be available under an expanded Medicaid uh, approach, as well as some claiming opportunities. So there's, there's just a, a tremendous tapestry of opportunity that's present. And we won't be able to get to all of those things necessarily, but um, we hope that there are some, some nuggets uh, in this conversation. Um, so with all that as a premise, um, let us uh, turn to the panel and begin um, our inquiry today. And, and uh, I think because so much of this effort uh, is gonna require adaptive thinking, not only on the part of county systems, state systems and the funders, but clearly in our provider community, maybe we can turn first to Chris Stoner Mertz and to Heather to think about uh, as you um, look back on the planning and design for, C for the FFPS part one and the Cal AIM uh, related um, adaptations, can you talk a little bit about your recent successes in, or what you're seeing Chris from maybe your clients uh, at the association in terms of, ex of their work to develop expanded access to mental health services for kids and families. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Happy to, Richard. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, there are so many policy wins that we're seeing and, um, you know, reflecting on what you just shared about sort of where we've been and, and the amount of time it actually takes to implement some of these things. I think the first thing I just want to make sure we we all agree on is that this is a marathon. <laughs> um, many of the policy wins, and as an example, through just if you just take the CYBHI, the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative, um, four point four billion dollars uh, support to both retain and recruit new workforce, um, a focus on building. Uh, wellness coaches for school-based work, um, the development of evidence-based practices, partnerships between schools and managed care entities, and then funding to support new behavioral health infrastructure, like significant investment in our overall children and youth infrastructure. And we have to be thinking about the long haul. So taking advantage of those opportunities, and many of our members have, you know, received grants in these different areas to support their work and to get them to also think with their county partners, with plans, with schools, how do we sustain this over time? So I know I'm I'm singing your tune, Richard, when I talk about how important it is that those integrated leadership teams at the local levels include all those partners, are thinking together about how do we take this opportunity today and make sure that it is a, a long haul and that as we're building this new infrastructure, it's just a foundation to what we can get to. Um, I think the the new opportunities through Medi-Cal, uh, enhanced care man management opportunities in partnership with managed care plans, community supports, community health workers. These are all opportunities for new provider types, not just you know, licensed clinicians to support 
children, youth, and their families across the different systems. Um, and one of the big opportunities we've seen for our providers is the development of a hub that we call the Full Circle Health Network that is helping link them in partnership with managed care plans to support foster youth, youth and juvenile justice, et cetera. So um, both excited about what we have at, in terms of opportunity and always wanting to pay attention to how does this get implemented, right? And how do we solve these problems on the ground um, through partnership and connection? Yeah, extraordinary um, and long needed work, right? To connect uh, a, a largely nonprofit provider community, your clientele, with um, managed care entities where the expertise, knowledge, experience is different, right? They live in different worlds uh, up until now uh, in many respects. And so your, your hub uh, is going to be uh, powerful. Can you, do you, are you in a place where you could tell us a little bit more about that hub and how it works or how it's envisioned? Well, it was officially stood up July 1. I'm happy to put the website in the chat when I'm done. And, um, and we very recently confirmed uh, a contract with Kaiser in the 32 counties where they'll be working. We're going to be one of their statewide lead network entities. So we, it is uh, growing very rapidly. And, and we've engaged about 60 providers so far and have contracts with uh, a number of managed care plans and that's growing. So very, very excited about what this can provide, particularly for some of those smaller organizations who really don't, haven't built Medi-Cal, haven't worked in that health space, because like you said, the language is different. It's really a translation between what a nonprofit, how a nonprofit thinks and acts and, and the great work they do in their community and health insurance, right? So very different worlds we're trying to bring together. Nice, thank you. Heather, can we turn to you for a moment to reflect on this first question about uh, what recent success you're seeing in development of expanded mental health services for kids and families from the managed care perspective? Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Richard. Um, and, you know, I want to echo what Christine said. So as Richard stated, my name is Heather and I'm the director for our complex children's program here at IEHP. It's a managed care plan. And oftentimes when I'm, you know, meeting with other agencies, organizations, they ask, what is an MCP? And I think, you know, I, it's, it's not very often that we get invited to the table. So it's nice to be here and it's nice to talk about collaboration and what that looks like. So, you know, we talked a lot about Colleen already. And I was really excited in 2020 prior to the pandemic when they started talking about Colleen and then that prevention thing. Um, but we've been working feverishly here to start to implement everything that Colleen wants us to address. And just to touch on a few of them, um, you know, more collaboration with the school, school system. So we have SD HIP, the Student Behavioral Health incentive program, you know, I know here in the Inland Empire, we're working with over nine school districts to make sure that we're not just addressing the physical health of our kids, but also the mental health and the social, you know, emotional, everything else, you know, to treat the person as a whole person. Um, some early successes that we're already seeing earlier this year, the dyadic care benefit rolled out under CY um, BHI and we've been working directly with an evidence-based agency to provide those dyadic care services. So we're already seeing an increase in those behavioral health screenings being conducted at the doctor's offices. Um, and I know our focus today is a lot on kids, but we, you know, when we talk about that family aspect, the moms bringing in their babies and they're screening them at their well child visits or they're screening them at their postpartum visits. And then they're able to re-engage with the health plan and link them to ongoing care coordination and case management services to keep that baby with the mom, to keep those kids with their families. Um, so I might be biased, but it's been a beautiful process so far. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks, Heather. We're gonna come back uh, a little bit later to um, maybe dissect uh, one or two of your experiences with the school districts, because I think those are super critical and, um, uh, powerful potentially down the road. Um, so thanks for that. Um, let me turn back then to the whole panel and just invite any reflection on 
some consideration when you think about all these opportunities. We've mentioned a couple this morning: CYBHI, Cal AIM, uh, enhanced case management. Some of the some of the details within those larger efforts, of course. Um, how do you how do you go about, or how have your partners gone about selecting an area of development to focus on? The, the menu is so long; it's like going to a restaurant, right? And the menu is overwhelming. Um, how 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 have you seen folks begin to identify where they should focus? Because no organization or no county partnership, in fact, for that matter, is going to be able to 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 dine from the whole menu, if you will. What what are you seeing folks do in the field? Um, and we'll turn this to the whole panel writ large, uh, whoever whoever has thoughts about that. I'd like to take a shot here, you guys. And, and the uh, defunct therapist in me says, built from strength. Meaning you know your safety net and the things that you do well. And try to match the things that you think works for the people you serve to the reform landscape. And get rid of all of the initials like Calim, CYBHI, like let, just let them go. Let them slide off your body and think new provider classes, new partnerships with the Medi-Cal managed care plan and new partnerships among county systems. Like those are the three buckets that everything lands in. And you can unpack them and dissect them. But I would begin by thinking, hey, what is it that we got in my jurisdiction, in my county that makes us awesome? Like, is it street outreach work? Is it a great mental health provider? Is it an awesome FRC network? Is it a great partnership with our county office of ed? Is it strong collaborative planning table? Like find that thing that you guys do good and then try to match it to the reform landscape and invest in it. Thanks, Alex. That that takes a fair amount of discipline for bureaucrats to, to shed those labels, right? That that you're suggesting. Can you give us give us really quickly those three buckets again, just really fast for the attendees? And I just want to say y'all that I know I talk fast and I think Medicaid is sexy. So people can like, you got to let that go, you know, sometimes too much. But I think when you let your gaze soften and see the forest through the trees, there is a set of opportunities that Medicaid will pay for providers it hasn't paid for before. CHWs, doulas, peers, and coaches. It's trying to get you to partner with your Medi-Cal managed care plan in new ways. And there are all kinds of initials in there, okay? ECM, community sports, dietic there, family therapy, but all of those run through your managed care plan. So like make friends with the Heathers of the world. Know what plan serves your people and the name and face and names of the kids of the people like Heather. Like learn who administers those benefits in your Medi-Cal managed care plan and become friends with them. And then there's a world of collaboration among and between your county mental health, your foster care, your juvenile justice, uh, and your CVOs that has to be invested in and managed because none of it matters if you don't got that table. Right on, thank you. Yeah, can I jump in there? Please. <clears throat> this idea of, uh, I was hoping Alex would say it because he says it better than I do, but that idea of like, let your gaze soften. Uh, and see the forest for the trees. And just think about, like actually get a mental image of that, please. Because I think so many of us are so used to within systems work, education, healthcare, public service, we're all inured and um, uh, trained to focus on what's in front of us and not necessarily focus on the whole, the whole system. And when we think about collective impact, Collective impact is everybody bringing their agenda to the table. It's, it's on it's on agenda list. It's like actually come bring your self interest, bring your organization's interest to the table, put them on the table. And then let's actually do like remember those uh, the, those things where it's like match, you know, uh, like the match game. Let's match. Where does Chris's uh, goals align with my goals? What does Heather's goals align with my goals? What do Alex's goals align with my goals? And then just align those things. And say that actually we are not separate trees that if you did believe that the surface a little bit our roots are entangled and if i do my job really well then hopefully that makes chris's job a little easier and so on and so forth and that if i have this idea of how our roots are entangled and how our interests are aligned and how we can actually collaborate and provide collective impact 
then we have a much greater chance of success. And so I would actually say like, let's not focus on one thing. Let's focus on what is our collective and what are our goals, right? Kids to grow up to be healthy, kids to be healthy while they're growing up, to support you know, healthy development. Uh, what are the barriers to that? You know, uh, race, systemic racism, uh, poverty, uh, homelessness, all the like ACEs scores. And how are we aligning our interests, our efforts to address those obstacles systemically so that we can achieve our goals collectively? Easy to say, not easy to do because we all have egos, right? And I like to do the things that I'm good at. I don't like to do the things that I'm not so good at. And so transformative work, collective impact, maybe I'm not so good at. Um, so it, it takes actually some humility to say like, I'm going to try to do this together uh, as opposed to just continuing to do the thing that I know I do really well. Chris, thank you. When you talk about collective goals, it reminds me of one of the points Kush summarized for us in leading up to this was that in your 2083 work locally in each county, those goals should be articulated within your memorandum of understanding, right? So you, every county jurisdiction that's doing this transformative work or funding it has goal statements or should have them within their, their uh, interagency leadership memorandum. So thank you for connecting the dots on that. Chris stoner Mertz, do you have thoughts about this, uh, this part of the inquiry? Well, I was thinking as others were talking about the county prevention plans that are being developed, right? Um, as part of FFPSA. And I think, you know, a lot of what is happening there is identifying, like Alex says, who are those partners, who are potential partners maybe that you haven't engaged, um, and, and using that as a frame to help think about who else you need to reach out to. Um, the other thing I'd add is not just what are you good at, but where are your gaps? Because you know, each region, each tribe, each jurisdiction has particular you know it, gaps that they know continue to be a struggle for them. And what, how can you use some of these funding opportunities, whether they're one time or ongoing, to really address those gaps? Who else do you need at the table that maybe hasn't been a typical? you know, person you reach out to, a regional center, for example, right? How are they engaged? So I think it's taking some of the tools that people are really expected to use anyway, and then how do you, how do you build mm -hmm. using those frameworks, so. Love that, thank you. And Richard and Chris, this is Kusha, just wanna remind folks that there is a link to all the approved comprehensive prevention plans in your resource sheet that, that Chris was just referring to. Thanks, Kush. And thanks, Alex, for dropping into chat your three buckets. Uh, that's helpful, I think, for folks. They can, can copy and paste those. And, uh, very good. Um, let's see. Um, I'm looking uh, then for panelists at, at uh, our, one of our fourth or fifth questions here is when you think about this and the, the ecosystem, um, are there are there other agencies we haven't talked about? Chris just mentioned regional centers. We've we're going to explore here in a few minutes the potential new role for managed care plans within the systems, uh, the larger ecosystem, if you will. But are are there other agencies or people that you would recommend talking to to maximize these early efforts? Uh, and and I'm thinking about our tribal partners, right, who are often isolated uh, geographically culturally from the larger system, right? Like what maybe specific guidance or thoughts do you have about that? Or what experience are you seeing from the field about yeah. uh, who do we talk to first? Any thoughts? Yeah. I was and just let's, looking let's, at the, oh, go ahead. Well, let's, let's do some specifics here. Cause sometimes when we talk, I think maybe if you're listening, there were in San Francisco County, there were 14 family resource centers representing 20 some sites. They were getting some money from their local first five, Prop 10 money. And those FRCs were able to partner with their public health department and claim matching funds through Medicaid administrative activities. So that wasn't a managed care strategy. So I'm not contradicting myself. I'm saying that like most of the opportunities are through managed care, but there are others 
through local partnerships with your local health departments and your specialty mental health system. So what I would say to answer your question, Richard, is to those of you who are looking at your prevention plans and how to sustain them when the money's gone, think beyond just the managed care plans. Like, don't forget that when you spend a non-federal dollar, you shouldn't do it naked. Okay? Like, every dollar that isn't federal that you spend, you should be thinking, can I claim administrative activities through the schools like Chris is doing? You know, ask me, hmm, can I claim it through the county mental health department, CMA? Uh, hmm, could this be the non-federal share of an EPSTT special mental health contract? You know, so those are just some specific examples of how you can partner at the local level in addition to the plan work. Sorry, Chris, go ahead. Appreciate that. Chris. Wait, me, Chris, or Chris? Chris Stoner Mertz, I thought, Chris, might you, maybe you have some additional thoughts. I about. did. Uh, um, I was I was just looking at the Yurok Tribes Prevention Plan, actually, um, and and some of their their thinking around the strategies. You know, I I think we have to, and, and from a policy level, there are opportunities, and we need to we need to help organizations, tribes, individuals push on those. So you know, in spite of the fact that we have some policy level changes, we still have contractual agreements and that with county jurisdictions or county mental health plans that may be limiting. And so I think we've got to open up what are the opportunities that in existing funding streams like Medicaid, um, where for instance, non-clinicians can be providing services, parent partners, community healers, you know, to address some of those, those cultural distinctions that are so critical. Um, so that was, that was one of the things I was thinking about as you were asking the question. Appreciate that. Thank you. I, Richard, I want to add something. Um, yeah. Kush did a fantastic job in her intro and her land acknowledgement of describing uh, the systems of oppression upon which our country was built, literally. And I think that those systems of oppression um, are uh, uh, at work and at play today. And um, I think we as government officials, public servants, think that, uh, you know, well, because we're here to serve, folks, um, folks are ready for our help. Uh, and we forget that um, uh, our institutions have broken a lot of promises. Uh, and have caused harm. And so we need to focus and really build relationships with folks who are in communities and already the trusted leaders in their communities. And I tell a story, um, a friend of mine back in New York City, he grew up in Harlem, he's a lawyer, and one of his uh, colleagues in the law firm wanted to run for state assembly and said, hey, like, you know, you're from Harlem, can you help me, you know, kind of get connected? And he's like, well, you don't need to talk to me, you need to talk to my dad, Big Harold. And he's like, okay, well, where, where do I go find him? So like, go up to 145th Street and 8th Avenue. Okay, and what, he owns a business up there or just go up to 145th Street and 8th Avenue. And like, where do I find him? And just go up to 180, 145th Street and 8th Avenue. So he gets in a cab, he goes up there, gets out, really busy intersection, Center Harlem. And he sees this guy sitting on a lawn chair on the corner. And kind of like, you know, looks at him. Walk, anyway, he walks over and the guy's looking at him and he's like, Hey, I'm looking for Big Harold. And he's like, yeah, and what, what you need with Big Harold? And he's like, oh, well, you know, I work with his son and whatever. I'm looking for a state assembly, whatever. And I, anyway, as he, as he starts chatting, he realizes this is Big Harold, right? And they start chatting. And, and as they're talking, you know, people are walking by and like, they keep like, you know, giving them pounds and, you know, like, oh, hey, thanks for calling my super. And, you know, and hey, that job worked out, you know, thanks for the recommendation. And Big Harold, after they talk for a while, he says, well, go grab a chair. And there's a couple lawn chairs like like leaning up against the building. So he goes and grabs a lawn chair and unfolds and he sits there and he sits on the corner chatting with Big Harold. And then he comes to realize that Big Harold is the leader in the community. When the furnace isn't working and the super won't return the phone calls, people go talk to Big Harold and Big Harold calls the super and says, hey, you need to do something. And he knows everybody. And because he knows everybody, he has relationships and he gets things done. But Big Harold isn't anybody. He doesn't have a title. He doesn't have any initials after his name. 
doesn't even have a like, particularly impressive job. He just knows the community and people know him and he's trusted. And so we talk about in our agency, we got to go find the big heralds. Right? Who's the big herald in the communities where we want, we want to serve? Because we got to go talk to those folks. We got to figure out who they are and what they're already doing and what they need. And how do we help to meet those needs? And don't go in and think that we know what people need. That's a great way to, uh, to, you know, to, to convince folks that they don't, <laughs> that you don't know what you're talking about. So go in asking questions, finding out who the big heralds are and, uh, and building relationships. Bruce, I love that wisdom. Uh, I, I've heard you reflect that story once before, and it's uh, it's just so compelling. Uh, uh, the, the power and wisdom to transform systems from uh, the street, right? From uh, the perspective of uh, the participant is powerful, for sure. And uh, I would add, make it easy for them to get supported and funded. <laughs> And yeah, resourced, so, right? This is where rather you know, than have our government systems get in their way. Yeah, I mean, we health workers, right? Right. Exactly. Doing the work now. That there's, a, there's a designation to to pay them. Yeah. So you know, find a way to hire them and draw down the dollars for community health workers, right? And it's self evident here how this um, is is one of the solutions needed to the workforce shortage, right? Like we we can address workforce issues by developing these kinds of effective. Uh, truly community center program. So I love this idea. Um, Chris, can we, uh, we, we won't have a lot of time today to talk about the intersection, although we've mentioned it once or twice, the intersection with the system of care work, but you're a, an, an interagency leadership team member in Sacramento County. Um, would you, what would you consider like a first steps that a system of care partnership might take? And I don't want to invite you too quickly into your talking about your, your development experience, because we'll get there in just a second. But just putting on your ILT participant hat here, what should a partnership be thinking about very first when they when they consider this these opportunities? Um, well, it's all about relationships, bottom line, right? Um, epigenetics shows us that experience shapes development and that relationships are the binding factor for human development, literally, you know, uh, neuroscience, you know, cognitively from a neuroscience perspective. So when we want to develop a system of care, the folks who are in that system of care need to focus on relationship building amongst themselves. And I think that sometimes like when, when you see like folks in, you know, in a meeting, it's like, oh, we do this warm welcome and then we get to the work. And if we have a limited amount of time, then we need to skip the warm welcome so we can get to the work. And in my experience, the relationship building is the work. If I don't trust you, I'm not, I'm not gonna pick up the phone and call you for help. If I don't trust you, I'm not going to send a referral to you. So how are we building those relationships amongst ourselves, amongst the leadership? How are we setting our egos aside and saying, you know, hey, let's go get some coffee. Let's what in our meeting. Can we actually meet in person and break some bread together? Um, how are we focus on getting to know one another, getting to know each other's values? And so that our, we're leading from that values perspective. And I know and like Alex and I started working a couple of years ago. But like we're friends, you know, like we went to a baseball game down in uh, Anaheim, you know, last week we were at a conference and we were like, well, let's yeah, let's go to a baseball game together because we focus on that relationship. And I know who he is like I don't like it's not about the it is about the work, but I know who he is and I know why he does the work and therefore I trust him. Uh, and, and he's one example, but uh, when we want to build a system of care, we got to care for one another first and foremost, in my opinion. Love that. Thank you. Chris, let's stay with you if we can, and uh, let's let's uh, open some space here for you to kind of do a, a a relatively deep dive in the time allowed on on what you've done in Sacramento County because it's pretty unique. You've established in the last two years a a network of school based supports and services using Medicaid mental health dollars. Right, this is really impressive work. Can you talk for a few minutes about the critical steps necessary for a county or a school system to be able to design and implement that kind of a an approach and we should acknowledge, and I'm sure you'll point this out, that this, there's some complexity to this. Um, what, what lessons have you learned uh, uh, in, in terms of developing medical services on school sites that others might benefit from? Yeah, sure. I can drop a link to our uh, website in the chat so folks can, can dive in. And first of all, I just want to say I haven't done much of anything. I've, I've assembled a great team, and that great team has done uh, all of the heavy lifting. Um, we have a partnership with our county department of health system or uh, health department, 
And uh, we are uh, working under the umbrella of the Federally Qualified Health Center or FQHC. And we're extending that FQHC status to schools, designating schools as satellite centers of the county FQHC. And within FQHC model, there is a uh, ability to bill for uh, non-specialty mental health, what used to be called mild to moderate. And so under that, when our schools get designated as satellite centers of the FQHC, we then SCOE hire licensed uh, mental health practitioners and, and associate mental health practitioners and now graduate clinical interns and peer specialists and all, all, the, all the things, all the classifications, and we place them in schools. Uh, they provide direct mental health services, so assessment, diagnosis, treatment, log it into the county electronic health record system, and then when they close their note, that triggers the billing mechanism on the FQHC, and we get reimbursed at the same rate as the county FQHC. So what we've created essentially is a revenue generating self-sustaining model of mental health in schools. Uh, so it's not a grant, it's not gonna run out. Um, it's no cost to the students and families, no cost to the schools, revenue generating model. Um, so the way that we've done that is through very courageous uh, and humble leadership at the top. Our county superintendent of schools, Dave Gordon, worked with uh, the then Department of Health Director, Peter Bielensen, and all of the subsequent health directors. We've had a couple um, to really uh, create the container for the teams to come together and build those relationships. Um, and I, I say humility, not lightly, because in crafting this model, it's not something that has been done before. So there was no roadmap for us to follow. So we were given explicit permission to make mistakes and to fail and get up and keep trying, fail forward. Uh, and we've done that a lot. <laughs> um, I failed uh, often and uh, still do. And uh, it's a great model because then we allow our team to try and endeavor. Uh, risk management, Kush talked about, or risk tolerance. Uh, how are we creating that um, culture where risk is uh, encouraged and failure is okay as long as we're failing forward and learning from our mistakes? Um, so I think a couple specific things is um, uh, really bridging the medical system and the healthcare and the education system. What do I mean by that? Is well, they speak different languages. Um, nobody in education understands what a diagnosis is, and very few people in healthcare understand what MTSS is, uh, multi-tiered systems of support. But it's, it's very much the same thing, right? How are we uh, designing interventions to address what's going on with, with, uh, with clients or young people? And a really clear example of this is uh, within the DSM-5, the definition of a diagnosis is a way of describing a group of symptoms which results in an impairment in functioning. Group of symptoms, impairment in functioning. <clears throat> and that leads to then a diagnosis of adjustment disorder or you know, anxiety, so on and so forth. Okay, group of symptoms that results in an impairment in functioning. In a school setting, we talk about chronic absenteeism. Okay, if you're chronically absent and you don't show up to school, that makes it difficult to function in the school. Behavior. If you're getting kicked out of school or kicked out of class a lot because of your behavior or the way a teacher interprets your behavior, that makes it difficult to function. If you're not passing your courses, by definition, you're failing. So attendance, behavior, course performance, the ABCs. Every school has access to this data. You can look at this data and run reports on the ABCs. And you can get a list of students who have an impairment in functioning based on that criteria, that group of symptoms, those students then could have a diagnosis. Well, we don't use that language in education, but we do use the language of attendance, behavior, and course performance. So run that data, find those students, and then go and engage with those students, reach out to them. That's a preventative model, as opposed to a treatment model, which is, let's wait till a kid gets suspended and then do something about it. Or chronic absenteeism, we have to start them or sarb them. Uh, that, that's a punitive approach that's really much treatment model perspective that's pro the problematizing the child. And what we have to do is start to look at what are the, the, the symptoms that are indicating to us that a child needs help 
and then reach out to the child and offer that help in a way that it speaks to them. And that could be peer specialists, it could be peer mentors, uh, and it could also include graduate um, uh, clinicians. So MTSS, all, right, classroom interventions, some at the tier two model, mentoring or groups, and then a uh, few at the top level is clinical interventions. So we're just overlapping the two systems in a way that makes sense to everybody and uses their language to say these, our goals are not misaligned. We're not using two different sets of criteria. We're using the same criteria. We're just calling it different things. We appreciate that. Thank you for um, pulling the multi-tiered systems framework in here because I think we're, we're, we're kind of anxious to see amongst all of the comprehensive prevention plans that will that have been or will be submitted from, from um, child welfare and probation, how many county systems have identified this parallel primary, secondary, tertiary approach that's inherent in public health and now in the family first work that's also parallel to the multi-tiered systems work, right? Like, so we have these three frameworks that are all identical and what kind of leverage points will take place in counties around that. I wanna come back though to your, your uh, FQHC based model. Can you just share with us a moment or two about the, the inquiry that some might be asking themselves about replicability. You, you've got in Sacramento County FQHCs, which are tightly connected to your county systems and the public health entity, as you mentioned with Dr. Bielinson's uh, work there. Is that model replicable in other counties? And what might the challenges be if, if, if their system is somehow different than SAC counties? So I wanna go back to the let your gaze soften comment, right? Don't focus so much on the mechanics, in my opinion. <clears throat> is it replicable? Sure, it's re replicable. And what are other ways to do this? Heather mentioned the SPHIP, right? Uh, incentivizing schools to contract directly with health plans to then allow LEAs to bill for, uh, for some of these things. And hold on to your seats, right? Because as of January, DHCS is gonna roll out the all payer fee schedule. This is allowing for schools to bill for mental health services provided at a school site, whether that is a tier one service, a tier two service, or a tier three service, whether you're a PPS credentialed uh, person, whether you're a clinical, you know, a uh, licensed clinician, whether you're a peer specialist, behavioral uh, health coaches are on the way or wellness coaches are on the way. So this is replicable, whether you want to contract with a uh, managed care plan yourself, whether you want to go through an FQHC model or whether you want to go through the fee schedule model. The main point is, um, you know, uh, figure out what the what is, right? Like, well, what is the need? How are you identifying students in need, whether it's through the ABCs or whether it's through some sort of screening or, or an ACEs screening, figure out who those students are and then get some folks in schools and they're probably already present Right. Who are the teachers who are leaving their doors open and letting the kids come in and, and eat with them during lunch? Right. These are folks who are already building relationships with students because it's all about relationships, remember. And then how are you layering on top of this and allowing for us to bill for those things and then creating structures where you don't have them? If you don't have licensed clinicians, you can now get them through a contract, through the fee schedule or through an FQHC model. Uh, all there's there's lots of different ways to uh, to uh, uh, draw down these medical dollars. Alex is way more versed in it than I am. Um, but how are we um, um, uh, how are we providing these services and then connecting them to the the changing landscape of medical? Lots of ways, as my grandmother, my late grandmother would say, to peel and eat a banana. Right. That's right. Uh, I love your counsel to focus on what you want, what what your collective partners want the outcome to be in terms of expanding access and getting uh, kids into care, and then you'll, you'll find a way. Beautifully done. Um, uh, Chris, one more question for you, and this is a little deviation on, on uh, that, that second question that we teed up for you, which is um, you, uh, you, you really stood up this exemplary model um, uh, in, in a way that didn't necessarily require that you work through your, your 2083 ILT, although you had relationships with public health, right? Many of the young people who potentially will get care, it seems to me, through your emerging system may be in, in parallel systems, in child welfare, probation, 
uh, regional center services, right? Like, so how, what, what would you advise um, by way of linking back then to the system of care work where, where at, at the very least the care coordination aspect would invite us into that kind of a conversation? How, how do you see eventually your new network of care and service delivery connecting to the larger ecosystem in Sacramento? <clears throat> I think, again, I don't mean to uh, continue to, to say the same thing, but it really is about those relationships um, and establishing that North Star and continuing to hold true to that North Star. Um, I, change is really hard. And folks, they, they you know that um, homeostasis, right? Folks want to continue to go back to what they've always done. Um, and, you know, I'm a I moved to New York many, many years ago, New York City, to pursue acting, and I spent uh, about 10 years as a professional actor. So what does that mean? It means I'm really used to hearing no and continuing forward, right? Um, so how do we kind of inure ourselves to the fact that we're going to hear no more than we're going to hear yes, and just stay true and continue to create the spaces and invite folks? Um, and as folks continue to share space with one another and build those connections and build those collaborations, kind of hear you deliver that same message over and over again about, you know, um, collaboration and referrals and connections, uh, release of information, how are we you know, keeping the kids at the center and just really holding true to that, even in the face of no and even in the face of folks saying yes and then doing something different because that's what they're used to doing. How are we just holding true to our model? Uh, and, and finding partners, right? Finding the partners in the work and that coalition of the willing who are willing to join you. Um, if anybody's ever seen that TED talk about how to create a, a movement, right? Where that guy's talking and there's like that video behind him of like the guy at the concert, the outdoor concert. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google it, you know, uh, how to create a movement. And it's this great idea of like um, the difference between a leader and a lone nut. And uh, sometimes you feel like a lone nut sometimes until you get the first follower. And then as folks start to follow, then you kind of create a movement, but sometimes it can really feel like you're shouting into the wind uh, at first and just uh, just just be true to, uh, to what you're doing. Uh, I love the folks that put in the chat that they know what I'm talking about because I'm feeling like a lone nut right now. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, just building those relationships and staying true and being patient and sometimes a little stubborn. Appreciate that. And, and again, your, your 2083 architecture uh, allows you to, to tap into the relationships, right? At least it gives you a structure to hold those relationships. It uh, does. And I think, um, you know, we, we, I mean, obviously we have an incredible group in Sacramento County and everybody's really aligned and, and really focused on that transformative leadership. Um, and, uh, and still folks are very used to doing what they're doing right and so we have to kind of continue to come back and say the message over and over again and you find your partners right the you know, who are the folks who are really aligned and and then you wind up seeing each other at the same meetings right um and uh and, and you kind of focus on the again that relationship building going to a baseball game together or whatever it is uh so that you can build that trust and uh and start to align align your values right on thank you sir can I just comment on, Please. because Chris yeah. mentioned it and I, I saw Wendy in the chat talking about leadership and it is um, so critical that those in those, people in those decision-making positions, right, are at the table. And uh, it's important to understand what, why they're there, right? Like, different leaders have different priorities that they bring to the table. And so kind of to your point, Chris, around relationships, if, if on initial engagement, one leader is not engaging in the way you might want them to get curious about why that is like what, as opposed to just write that off, like, let's, let's find out more. What, what is it that, that, is their jam, right? What do they want to get done? What's their effort? And I think you talked about this too, Chris, earlier, just like find out what everyone's passion for their work is, engage in that. It's not just about let's go get some money to get some stuff done. It's it's really engaging people on that personal level, including the leaderships. Yeah, Chris, thanks. All righty. 
let's stay with you, Chris, if we can. Um, Medi-Cal billing and claiming for an organization that uh, is new to it or unfamiliar with it is super daunting. Uh, we've heard this reflection um, many, many times the last few years. Uh, this dilemma is only going to get worse. What, what suggestions might be present uh, in your experience or from your clientele where a CBO is poised to be part of a community pathway, specifically under CPP, and where the institutional knowledge for these systems, these complex systems, is not present? How do they take advantage of it? What's the, what are the first things they should be thinking about? Get help. <laughs> um, you know, Unlike most people, Alex thinks Medicaid is sexy. Um, I think of it as a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> um, and, and it's like, how can we get it to do what we want it to do, right? And a lot of the new policy um, implement, implementation can get more done. So yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, get help from organizations that, are, that have built Medi-Cal. Um, there are, you know, we certainly know consultants out there doing that work. We have organizations who are our members who are experts and have been doing that work for met for many decades with their mental health plans. Um, and I know Alex will say this, engage your, your managed care plans. If you don't know how to do that, call us about full circle, um, and, you know, take it one step at a time. Don't try to do it all at once. It, it is daunting. Um, it is, a, a, you know, particularly in the specialty system, in spite of what payment reform has promised, we have not yet seen the reality of a reduction of paperwork. Um, and, you know, we continue to work with the state on, on how and the counties on how to get that to, a rea to be a reality that there's less paperwork rather than more. Um, but coming together and working together and looking for organizations that have done that well, um, I would say re reach out to us for, for sure. Appreciate that. Alex? Yeah, just let's do some language clarification so everybody holds it. Our mental health system in California is bifurcated. It has the county mental health plan, what we call the specialty mental health system. It has the managed care benefit that we call the non-specialty system. You guys have to hold those two frames, okay? Lots of different names have been used over the years, but the names we now use are specialty, county, and non-specialty plan. To the question of where to begin, my strong recommendation is to begin with what I will call a marginal revenue strategy. So there are two ways to look at the cost of something. Do I get enough revenue to fully cover costs and indirect? Like if I want to hire 10 CHWs and I have zero now, can I hire 10? Or do I have four people who are working as navigators who I can get certified as CHWs and if they build, I'd have enough to hire a fifth? Are you with me? fundamentally different approaches to the same problem of trying to expand access to CHWs. If you begin with a full cost reimbursement strategy, you will find trouble. Unless you have significant one-time funds to glide path to sustainability, and when I say glide path, two years minimum, you should begin with a place where you already have an investment that you can learn with training wheels where the revenue isn't necessary to cover the cost of the staff member. So you're with me, marginal versus full cost? I'm gonna stop there. Alex, I, I would also add, and I, I saw this in the chat, sort of concerns over audits, et cetera, and I think those are very real, Richard. Um, and, there is at least an attempt at the level of, of DHCS to begin to move away from an audit process that recoups funding, but that and move to a system and an approach that is much more around quality improvement. So, you know, we haven't seen that in action yet, but it is certainly something that the state. And, and the counties have been talking about the, the mental health plans specifically. 
Um, and I think we need to keep pushing from a kind of an advocacy standpoint because a lot of this isn't about fraud and someone just trying to get money not providing a service. It is about learning how to use the systems and the resources and 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 get the funding right. Um, so we're pleased to see that at least from a policy standpoint and really look forward to making sure that that gets implemented on the ground too. Thanks, Chris. Uh, second question, Chris, um, kind of serving as a bridge here as we begin to, uh, we'll come back to Heather in a moment or two to, to, to get some additional perspective about managed care plans and their role. Um, given that in some ways that the, they are the bridge between parallel prevention service delivery systems, community-based organizations that is, how might CBOs, uh, leaders, developers, managers within the community-based organizations work with managed care plans to, to leverage and maximize their efforts? Are you are you seeing uh, evidence that there's um, that bridge being built there uh, at this point? We we do. Um, I think again, it's that languaging and understanding each other's worlds, what the expectations that the state places on the plans, and then how how do we utilize the skill set of those community-based organizations to help those plans meet their goals and requirements? Um, and and helping be that translator, it's certainly one of the things we're 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 trying to do. Um, and but there's interest and willingness on both sides from my perspective. You know, many of these, particularly the children and youth, um, in foster care and juvenile justice that are already being served in those systems by many of these community-based organizations. It's like, we know those children and those families. And so it's, it's very different than the rollout for ECM for homeless adults, for example, right? Where you had to kind of go out on the street, find those, those individuals, connect to them, these children are already in other systems. So to the extent that we can really link um, those, those system engaged or system involved children, youth and families to plans, we can get much more of that happening more quickly within the system. So um, I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, what, th thank you. Are you seeing um, places where that's happening that you feel um, there could be learning from? Is there, is there a local jurisdiction where there where there's evidence for some of that that, that comes to mind? Um, we've begun to do that with the Alameda Alliance. Um, I know that that the LA plans, I'm sure Heather could talk more about, you know, they, they've had a history in the Inland Empire of having that already in terms of their relationships with around foster use. So I'm sure you'd have a lot to share there, Heather. But, and it is, again, we're talking about July, <laughs> it's September. So it is just beginning. Um, but yes, there's certainly lots of hope out there and some and some initial uh, great connections, yeah. Thanks, Chris. That, that does uh, give us a little bit of bridge, Heather. Can we ask you a similar question? Um, can, can you, is there an example or two from your experience? You, you cited one or two early on, but talk a little bit more about this early effort. What what might be some systemic strategies that would enhance or support the, 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 the effort here, um, particularly thinking maybe about um, implications to workforce? Um, uh, how, do, how are you seeing this addressed in your, in your world? Yeah, thank you. You know, I really like going after Christine because she, I feel like she echoes my concepts um, that, you know, we operate here at the health plans, you know, um, I really like what you said, Christine, about communicating um, with the managed care plan because we need the community just as much as I think sometimes the community is trying to do this work and the managed care plan wants to work with you. We want, um, you know, we know that these services need to be implemented and we have a regulatory requirement to do so. So we would much rather find a community-based organization or entity that's already doing it and partner together. Um, you know, we talked about a lot earlier where you know the landscape of what's going on. You know, I'd much rather talk to the community about what 
they want and what they need as opposed to trying to implement some program that I think somebody needs. Um, you know, we talk about doulas, um, but it's not just doulas. You know, I, I was at a conference a couple weeks ago. It's, you know, for our black moms, they want black doulas. They want people that can relate to what's going on with them in the community. So, um, so going back to your question, sorry, I kind of went off on a tangent, but in regards to sharing some examples about early successes, and I think what we need as well as data is really important. Um, all too often, we will get inquiries. Um, so Christine, you mentioned the foster care. We've had a foster care benefit here at the Inland Empire uh, for, I think, eight or nine years now. So ahead of Colleen, um, and in some of those early discussions, and work groups, we were talking a lot about data. You know, we'll have a foster care agency reach out to us and they want help. And then we're, can we get the members and from, you know, their information and they're really hesitant to share the names. Um, and it's hard for us to help if we don't know who we're reaching out to and what's going on. So working on those relationships, establishing those memorandums of understanding, which DHCS is gonna make us do anyway next year, um, but establishing those data sharing mechanisms so we can work collaboratively because um, I think as all of the speakers have said so far, we're, we're working with the same population. Um, so let's work smarter and not harder and let's see how we can kind of wrap around these families to get them what they need. Um, we talked a little bit about, in the, uh, I think Kush went over some facts and data around, you know, 85% of kids who enter the child welfare system were eligible for Medi-Cal. So what happens when they become a ward um, and they become a dependent, you know, you are going to go into Medi-Cal, but you're going to go see for service. So it's really important to work with the foster care system to help get them back to a managed care plan. Um, and then that data piece comes back. You know, we don't want to duplicate efforts. We don't want to, you know, immunizations. Are they on track? You know, where, what was going on? So working with your managed care plan to kind of get that picture, especially if they were established with that managed care plan prior to becoming a foster child. Um, you know, I have a, an example recently, we had one of the deputy directors from the child welfare agency reach out to us and they were having a very hard time policing that child and keeping them in placement. I think they had been replaced a couple of times due to behaviors. Um, and it wasn't until they reached out to us and we saw the history with the child before um, foster care that they had diagnosis of autism and they were exhibiting some signs of aggression. And we were able to establish a weekly check-in with the county child welfare agency, the health plan and the mental health plan to kind of bridge together. They were able to find, I think, a relative placement. And then we got ADA services involved in the home. And we worked directly with that agency to make sure they were set up in the home system, as well as county mental health got involved, I think, for some PBS services in the very beginning. Um, and I can tell you to this day, they're still, we're still meeting with them, not as frequently, we don't do weekly check-ins anymore, but because things have stabilized, um, but we were able to get their behavioral health needs met as well as their medical needs, so. Such a powerful example, right? Like we, we, many of us live in this world where all we hear about are the systems that are not working, right? And that's why mm -hmm. these reforms are necessary. But I want to point out for the attendees that what I just heard you say is that the, the public systems, the welfare system, in this case, in a particular county, engaged you to say, we have a unique need. This is a, a managed care, a young person who's going to get his or her needs met via managed care. We need specialized services, behavior analysis. And can you help us get it? And, and so it, it, here's, a, here's a case study, a, a microcosmic case study, right, where they, the, the public system links to managed care to get the needed support to stabilize the minor, right? So uh, th this is the kind of outcome I think that that systems of care envision certainly. Um, I love that story. Thank you, uh, Heather, for for sharing that. Um, um, you mentioned the memorandum of understanding, and I would just point out for a moment, uh, it's, there, there'll be an obligation on managed care plans and the county systems to do MOUs under this expanded work that's coming in January. There is a, a, a an existing memorandum of understanding underneath AB 2083 that if I were coaching a county, I would say, don't write a new MOU, just engage your managed care plan to join your existing system of care MOU and put all the necessary content into that agreement. 
and then you're binding a new, you're, you're, you're closing the family tree, right? You're bringing everybody into the same conduit, if you will, of that work. Uh, and I suspect you'll, you'll get uh, state approval for that kind of thinking. So I love that. Um, let's see, can we back up a little bit, Heather, to one of our earlier questions uh, for you in light of the Cal AIM work, um, thinking about this relationship with public systems that's gonna be so critical. Um, are there, are there uh, things that public departments need to know, like the, 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 the department heads and deputies, what do they need to know about managed care plans uh, in order to be positioned to do this effective partnership that's gonna be needed? Um, I think as simple as knowing what a managed care plan is and what we offer, um, you know, we already have established MOUs with both, we're a two county health plan, so Riverside and San Bernardino County, and we have established MOUs with both counties already for our foster care program. Um, and we have quarterly, you know, meetings, as many of you all probably do, with our child welfare system. And, you know, I was over this benefit for embarrassing like a year and a half before the county was like, what do you do? What do you offer? And they had been established for a very long time, but no one had ever asked that question. So now we have it regularly where we just, you know, we have a slide deck and we talk about, okay, you have, you know, we had a, an example where a mom, you know, was facing, you know, allegations of um, medical neglect. But then when we started talking to the mom and finding out what was going on, she didn't have transportation and she had other kids with special needs. So, transportation is a Medi-Cal benefit. <laughs> it is covered by the health plans. We have an obligation to cover those services. Um, and even if it's to the community-based service, so if you have a specialty mental health service, the managed care plan still has to cover that transportation need. So, you know, explaining that and working together, you know, um, under the FFPSA, there's a lot of evidence-based recommendations in regards to treatment, a lot of those services are covered by the health plan, parenting, social skills, in-home services, you know, you talked about community support services, those are all health plan benefits. So I think um, as rudimentary as it sounds, understanding what a managed care plan can and should be doing um, and how we can, again, work smarter, not harder, let's work together on some of these cases. And, you know, I, I bet you if, you know, if you were to reach out to your managed care plan and ask for help for, you know, a family or what's going on, they're probably already on our radar. They're probably already someone that we're working with, case managing or whatnot. So let's work together. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, last question, I think specifically for you at this point, um, could you could you share a little bit um, about, you know, thinking about these medical opportunities uh, help us drill into enhanced case management a little bit. And uh, how can that, how do you see that being effectively robustly established uh, as it relates to, you know, ECM writ large implementation, but also the, the prevention planning processes for kids already in child welfare. There, there is, um, I have heard folks express concern around uh, redundancy, right, between an enhanced case manager and a wraparound team, for instance. Um, and can, can you talk through with us how you envision kind of the care coordination and doing, to your point, smarter, not more or harder, right? Talk to us about ECM a little bit. Sure. So earlier this year, we were having conversations with the child welfare system about ECM and explaining to them, you know, this is what's coming down. It goes in, into effect in July. Um, and I remember one of the managers was like, but that's already what we're supposed to be doing, you know, case management, um, check-ins with the families, making sure that they're going to their, all of their appointments and that all of their, you know, needs are being met, going into the home, meeting them where they're at. Um, so for the child welfare population, you know, as if they're had a family maintenance, have an active family maintenance case within the past 12 months, um, and are currently part of the child welfare system, they will qualify and be eligible for enhanced case management where they'll get that extra touch and support to, you know, make sure that they're whole and kept whole and they're healthy so that, you know, that they can just take care of a five-year-old. We want to make sure they're a healthy um, and established adult as well. So that's for ECM for the 
child welfare population, but we have the juvenile justice population going live as well. So children exiting the juvenile justice system and, you know, obviously their parents, if they meet that criteria as well, we will wrap around that family. They would be one of the ECM eligible populations as well. And there's a handful of others, um, high utilizers of the ER, homeless youth and adults. Um, and there's postpartum population as well. So that's really what ECM is. It's that enhanced case management. Um, it's not just your one touch. It's really going into the community, meeting the people where they're at, you know, in Starbucks, their home, wherever, what, whatever that looks like, and making sure that they have the services that they need, whether it's us or engaging those community-based organizations, working with child welfare, et cetera, to access the services that are needed for that family. Did I answer your question, Richard? I think so. Uh, I think the, the 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 leverage and the the anticipated dilemma that it prevents in terms of care coordination is that in an intensive wraparound scenario, there's often a community broker or a person on the team that has that role of community brokerage, and ECM looks and smells a lot like that. And so people are saying. We don't need more of that. We well, we don't need more of it in an individual case by case basis, right? So, uh, it just invites us to to think through the very detailed nuances of coordinating care into a new new funded structure, right? That's available under under ECM. So, not that it can't work, just that we have to be mindful about not overwhelming the family and confusing the family, right? By having a new provider disconnected from the existing providers, so to speak, and it doesn't matter which portal they come through. But it's still going to be a dilemma. Alex, I'm I'm seeing you probably got some thoughts about this. Yeah. So, um, man, I got a lot of thoughts on this one, you guys. But let's just try to break. Let's try to keep it simple. Uh, ECM pays somewhere between three hundred fifty and four hundred and fifty per member per month. Heather, sound right? Yeah. So, if you think about that, think about like five grand per kid per year. So one of the biggest, there's six populations of focus, soon to be seven, to Heather's point. The biggest one, the one where the most children will be eligible, will be all children who meet specialty mental health criteria. So that's already half of all kids in care. Remember, 55% of kids in foster care already are getting a special mental health service. And with the new criteria, all kids in care automatically qualify. That's 55,000 kids in out-of-home placement in California. But for those of you working in the prevention space, you can also think of just about any kid who is showing up in your prevention networks will probably qualify through population of focus number three. And the key thing there, if you're a provider or a system, is go get that money. Like if you're already in contact with that kid, you should be, and that family, you should be the central ECM provider for them. So if you have a trusted alliance or caring relationship with a child or family. Make that determination of, do you have the administrative capacity to get under contract with the managed care plan? Can you submit a qualifying claim? And we can talk about all of that. And can you make it pay? But particularly if you already have a specialty mental health contract, every single kid you're already seeing, you should get ECM for. And you should expand the depth and quality of the work you do with those children and families. Yeah, thanks, Alex. I, I don't hear anybody in the field expressing concern about having the additional resource. Uh, what I hear from folks is uh, making sure that that resource is integrated into an existing service team in a way that doesn't disrupt the care. And that, that's the detailed kind of pragmatic question that's emerging that we'll have to just walk through on an individual, you know, county by county, system by system basis, if you will. Yeah. And I'll, I'll make one, maybe more, a little bit more of a rant. There are some managed care plans that are contracting with national care coordination firms. And I think we should all resist that. So Heather, I'm not making any comment about IHP, but it's happening in the field. Uh, second, I, I just am personally resistant to this, this idea that we're over case managing families and kids. Like I worked in West Oakland for 12 years. I didn't once run into another case manager with the families I served. So I just want to say, I, I don't, I just, I, I want to resist any characterization that poor communities are flooded with support. The reality is that most poor people suffer alone. And so I wanna just be careful, like that's a personal statement, but it's been the truth of my history in safety nets. Um, 
But what I would say to all of you who are working on your prevention plans, you funded stuff. You did stuff with this money. And your ability to sustain it is going to be largely written through your partnership with the Medi-Cal Managed Care Plans, particularly these new non-clinical supports, ECM. And we haven't talked about community supports, which is largely housing, but a really important one as a prevention strategy. And some of these new mental health benefits um, we haven't talked too much about. Thanks, Alex. Yes. Yeah, to Andrea's point in the chat, it's like, find me who's got trust and alliance first. Everything else follows from that. Right on. Alex, um, we have not um, kind of dived deeply into the role that public health systems can play here. Uh, can we put you on the spot and just talk to us a little bit about the critical need for um, child and family service organizations to um, better or de better connect or deepen the connection with their public health partners? Because so much of these reform dollars are contingent on public health partners being involved in the planning, design, and rollout. Yeah. So what's interesting is the legacy public health systems are becoming providers to the managed care plans. Are you with me? Let's try to think of that one, right? So let's just think, if you're Black Infant Health, you're Family Nurse Partnership, you're any one of the other home visiting programs that a county has, you're trying to get under contract with Heather, like San Mateo County is doing, like Alameda County is doing, both home visiting programs becoming ECM providers. Or if you're California Children's Services, medically fragile kids, you're, that's one of the populations of focus. You're trying to get in a contract to the managed care plan. So there's other public health departments that are doing really creative things like become the intermediary for doulas, Orange County First Five, Los Angeles Department of Public Health, where they are creating themselves as the intermediary. Or like neighborhood networks in San Diego for CHWs are other examples of entities that are emerging to kind of play that broker role between the managed care plans and a distributed network of providers. So public health departments and traditional public health actors turn out to be really good partners in your quest to connect to the managed care plans. And that one reason for that, and I'm gonna go a little technical here, you guys, but one, one of the history of these benefits is tied to something called health homes and whole person care. So ECM and community supports came out of a decade worth of messing around with new benefits. And most of those benefits were controlled by county health systems. So they had a privileged space in the negotiation with managed care plans. And that's why they're ahead of the game a little bit in terms of having contracts. So if you're not sure what's going on with your county, like reach out to your county health department and ask, do you, are you in relationship with the Medi-Cal managed care plans? And is that something we could maybe partner with you on? because you'll find they are a little bit more advanced than the CBOs in terms of building those bridges. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Um, we've got uh, ample time, but Alex, I wanted to come stay with you for one more question here around the 1115B waiver opportunities for foster youth and child welfare services. Can you, can you spend a, a minute or two just kind of deepening the well around what 1115B is going to mean to systems. We've hit on a couple aspects already, but tell us anything else we may have missed. Yeah. So we're we're going down the Medicaid rabbit hole. People are probably throwing up in their mouth a little bit right now. So just stick with me, okay? There's two federal waivers that kind of define our system, the 1115 and the 1915B. The 1915B is your county mental health plan. Are you with me? The 1115 is the thing that created whole person care and health homes, all that other stuff. So in the new 1115 waiver, there is going to be a, it's called Behavioral Health Connect. There is going to be a pretty significant investment in child welfare, including activity stipends and a pot of money for you to work together with your managed care plan. So track it. If you're a local child welfare system or a community-based organization, the 1115 waiver called BH Connect, so you can Google DHCS BH Connect, is going to be a real opportunity for you to track for sustainability of your prevention planning work. There's also some work happening in CDSS to re-examine its rate structure. I can't go into details yet because it's not been formally approved or proposed. But I think there will be also some new resources available through child welfare departments to look at this stuff. Um, but quickly on the waivers, the 1115 waiver 
that the state has proposed to the feds is going to have some direct funding for things like activity stipends for kids in care. It's going to have a, a pool of funds for you to tap so you can build some of these relationships. Um, so without going too far down that detailed road, uh, 1115, come in, it's, be, it's sum, submitted in October, should be approved by January, uh, is something for you all to track. The 1915B waiver is what covers your Medi-Cal, your mental health plans in the counties. And the key thing to note in that one is the new access criteria. So your county mental health plans now have a much wider gate for kids to access. And I know it's not showing up and it's probably super frustrating, but uh, in our resource guide is a link to the 1915B definition of medical necessity. And it's something to learn. Uh, so you can advocate more directly to your county mental health plans. Alex, thank you. All right. I think uh, at this point in our uh, time together, we're going to invite Kush to come back in. And we've had a pretty dynamic uh, set of conversations going on um, periodically in chat. And there may be some other questions that I certainly have missed. But Kush, let me yield back to you and you can tee up some additional questions for us as we um, kind of wind into the fourth quarter here. Great, thanks Richard and thanks to the panelists for a really rich conversation thus far. All right, so just to remind folks, we've got, there's a Q&A feature uh, on your menu bar. And if you type the questions in that Q&A feature, I will see them immediately um, and I can lift them, I can lift them up. Um, if, they're, if they were in the chat, um, I think most of the questions in the chat did get handled um, by the back and forth with the panelists. Um, but if you want me to lift it up, it was much easier if you put it in the Q&A box. All right, so here are the questions I have so far. Um, is it possible that restorative justice counselors or staff could qualify as wellness coaches? Um, who'd like to jump into that one, Alex? Do you? Alex Briscoe, I'd probably yeah, go to you, you know, first. I'm, I'm happy to start. And, you know, Chris is, so first of all, the, you know, we're at least a year away from the wellness coaches. So I would just say the answer is they have to have an associate's degree and a bachelor's degree. So those are going to be the two minimum qualifications from an educational background. And then they'll have to pursue the process of getting credentialed, meaning do the course as determined by HCI, which will likely be, um, as I understand it, in the community college or CSU system. Um, that's about all the detail I can give you right now on that. So the answer is I would hope so. Um, I'll leave it at that. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah, I would. No, go ahead, Chris. Sorry. Well, all, I was just going to add, and I know we've talked a lot with HK about this. Uh, it's, it's making, again, a point um, Alex has made before, but there are already ways for these services to be provided and billed by individuals who are who come under the umbrella umbrella of other qualified individuals in medi-cal um and so i wouldn't necessarily wait <laughs> to see what happens with those wellness coaches but to say how, how what kinds of support do kids need whether it's in school or in the community and how do we utilize everyone that we possibly can over and above just licensed clinicians to get those services available. Thanks. And then Chris Williams, you were going to jump in. I'm not sure I have much more to add. I, I would agree with what Chris just said that I think there, um, I, my, my perspective is that DHCS uh, is doing uh, a lot to make sure that folks who are already doing work uh, are now able to bill for that work. So whether it's a wellness coach or a community health worker or a peer specialist, like there's likely ways under the fee schedule that restorative coaches are gonna be able to bill. Um, we don't know, I can't say that for certain, but I think it's, it's pretty likely. Thank you, Heather. You were off mute, so I just wanted to check if that was because you wanted to jump in um, or no. Nope, okay. No. All right, next question. Um, what is the EBP that is being used um, in CYBHI schools? All right. Go ahead, Alex. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. What is the evidence-based practice being used under CYBHI in schools? I think the the so the question came about the time when we were talking about the the dyadic benefit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So so that, that, let's let's do another one of those forest through the trees moments, okay? Yeah. You're probably going to punch me in the face if I say that again, but like let it let, let it go for a second. What I would say is. We are trying to legitimate schools as essential actors in a reformed youth mental health system. Like, and there's a lot that's happening from community schools to SB HIP to school partnership money to mindfulness money. Like everybody and their grandma's throwing their money at schools. Okay. But something really big is coming and it was landed in the chat that I want to try to explain to everybody listening. All of these one time dollars are meant to grease the skids for this thing that's coming called the all payer fee schedule. And I wanna explain it colloquially to you so you can hold it. If anybody on this webinar got in their car and drove to Glacier National Park in Montana, and heaven forbid you got in a car accident there and you got treated by the emergency department there, even though that emergency department does not have a contract with your plan, your health plan would have to pay for that service because it's emergent delivered out of network. The rules that govern managed care plans say that they can build a network of providers, but if something is delivered that's emergent out of that network, they still have to pay for it. What AB 133 did is establish schools as automatically in network for all plans, Medi-Cal and commercial plans. That's 95% of children in California. Meaning beginning in some, Chris, I think it starts in 2024 and some, and then another round in 25, and then some again in July. In, the, in over three cohorts, all schools and charters and their designated providers. So it doesn't just have to be school staff. It can be who they say is their provider on the school site. Will be eligible for, if they drop a claim, it's gonna be paid. And all claims will go to a single third-party administrator who will then parse out the claims to the managed care plan, commercial or Medi-Cal, collect the revenue, pull it back, and send it back to the school that submitted it. So all of this is prologue to a future state where all services delivered on school campuses must be paid for by managed care plans. And that's beginning as of January of this year. Yeah, it's starting with pilots across the state and then over time being made available. I will, I, the, the one caveat I would add to that, Alex, and it's really important because if you're working with schools who may not be aware of this or may not know exactly how to engage, it is an option for schools. It is not required. So educate your, your school partners if they're not on this call or they're not Chris yeah. Williams, <laughs> who I know is all over this. When remember, we got four year olds in schools now, right? We got TK stuff happening. So there's a chance to do stuff there that's powerful and important. And I will also just say to those listening that a lot of schools are hiring directly. And I think many of us would rather see them partner with Chris's members or their county office of ed, that schools don't have to do this themselves. In fact, I would argue they're better off partnering with someone who does this for a living, like Chris or Seneca Lincoln, Fred Finch, West Coast, Hathaway Sycamores, Pacific Clinics, those kind of folks. Um, I think schools aren't so good at that partnering thing, but once they learn the benefit of it, they don't have to manage the billing, they will, will do better. But for all of you who are looking at prevention strategies, schools are essential partners and settings. And just, to, just to try to summarize, Sorry, Chris, were you going to say something? Uh, well, I no, go ahead and summarize, and then I'm going to, Rocio, a uh, heads up. I'm going to ask if we answered your question, and if you want to come on mute, off mute to clarify. But Chris, go ahead. So as of uh, this January, it's three months from now, the first cohort is going to roll out this fee schedule. It's going to be roughly 50 uh, districts. In California, there's like 1,300 districts, so about 50 or so districts are going to pilot this in January. In July, cohort number two is going to roll out. 
So these are folks, so County Offices of Ed have already gotten a letter of interest. They've already emailed uh, DHCS, um, some of the school districts that are uh, that they're recommending. So that selection process is already happening. July, it'll widen, and then January of 2025, it'll be available to all school districts and institutions of higher learning. And as Alex pointed out, it's gonna be uh, at schools or school adjacent. So like expanded learning opportunities, uh, community-based organizations that partner with schools, these are places where those uh, services will be able to be rendered uh, and then billable according to the fee schedule. The fee schedule itself has not been has not been published yet, so we don't know the rates. And the third party administrator has not yet been selected, so there is going to be some documentation, uh, but we don't have uh, a lot of the details just yet. Great, thank you, um, Rocio. Would, did. If that didn't answer your question, would you be willing to come off mute and, and, and clarify and see if we, we, we got to it? We must have got to it. Okay. All right. Um, next question. Is there, is there technical assistance for system development so that reporting evaluation and fiscal is set up on the front end to work with the managed care plan? Within which initiative? <laughs> um, within SB HIP, there is. Um, within the fee schedule, uh, yes, there will be technical assistance. Um, uh, yeah, there's a, a lot of different kind of funding streams, and I think each of those funding streams either has or has plans for technical assistance, and it varies within those funding streams who that technical assistance provider is. Uh, yeah, so for schools, so first of all, it's a crowded landscape of people saying they know what to do. And anybody who says they know exactly how to do this is full of shit, okay? Like, we're trying to treat away poverty and racism. So like, there's no magic wand, put aside the FOMO, right? Like, we're all trying, you know, blind leading the blind here. But there are some really important resources as you walk down this road. For stuff related to schools, look to your county offices of that. They have technical assistance dollars for community schools partnership programs and through SB HIP. And so depending on your county, sometimes the county's office of ed don't have these skills, but sometimes they do. So that's a one really, really good place to start is the county office of ed for school-based stuff. There is something called the TA marketplace that's available through the state that is has a list of technical assistance providers. We'll make sure that get that how to access that gets added. If you're a community-based organization, I would recommend reaching out to Chris. Um, you can email me direct, y'all. We're funded by philanthropy. We'll never ask you for money. Uh, we're around for another year. Um, and I can give you my best shot and connect you to, you know, it depends by region what's available. Um, and finally, if you're looking at the, the, the dyadic benefit or the new non-special mental health benefits, there is something called the UCSF Center for the Advancement of Dyadic Care. And I would really recommend you take a look at that website. I'll drop it in the chat because I don't think it's in our resource guide. And just to clarify, he meant the other Chris, Chris Donor Mertz. If you're a CBO, reach out to Chris Donor Mertz. If you're uh, education, you can reach out to me or your county office of it. I would also just add to that that we we did a presentation yesterday at the Child Welfare Council. Um, on on many of these same topics, and I, I I just think we all need to keep saying to the state more technical assistance is needed because this is complex stuff, um, and and really does take some time and expertise to figure out. So let's let's all send that message to our state partners. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple of more questions that aren't directly related. Uh, oh, wait, oh, just check it. Uh, that aren't directly related to this discussion. I just want to lift them up for our audience and let you know that in, answers may be coming to those questions um, in, our, in our November learning forum, which is the final one for the year. 
one question is, does, does DSS have um, an anticipated timeline as to when the Families First Prevention Services ACLs, all county letters and ACINs, all county information notices will be released to operationalize the state's five-year prevention plan? So um, th the short answer is, I don't know, um, but we're going to have uh, Cheryl Treadwell um, from the Safety Permanency and Early Intervention Bureau at CDSS with us to talk about updates um, in November. And I would, I, would invite, if, I would invite our participant to join us um, and ask that, that very question of Cheryl um, in November. And then there was another, there was another request um, about sort of, you know, how, how are we gonna keep this conversation going? Once this learn, you know, once the learning series is over, um, and also in November, we're going to be talking to you about a virtual um, online community of practice um, that has been built uh, for California, um, sponsored by the Office of Child Abuse um, Protection uh, Prevention uh, (OCAP), and that is going to be the place where we hope all the peer exchange is going to happen. The time for sort of di you know, didactic, more one directional webinar based education, I think is over. The, the plan plans are being approved and there are local customizations and implementation issues that need to get dealt with. Like, okay, who all is doing guaranteed basic income? Who all is gonna do motivational interviewing? Those folks need to start to be able to talk together. Um, rather than wait for the Q&A session on webinars. Uh, and so that will unveil CalPrevents and show you a little bit um, in November. So please attend then and we'll show you where this is going. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, with that, I'm going to share screen and turn it over to, to Cal Trim to bring us home. Thanks, Bush. I first want to thank all of the panelists today. The conversation was far ranging and I think extremely useful on both strategic and philosophical fronts as well as technical detail. Um, and of course, as always to thank our partners, Implematics and Casey Family Programs. I do want to note that we are dropping a very brief survey in the chat now. Please take a couple of minutes and fill that out. We do use that feedback, both to look at your needs for comprehensive prevention planning information, but also to understand your training needs for both you and your teams um, across the prevention continuum. And in November, on the 1st of November, we will be doing the final forum in this series celebrating accomplishments and looking forward to the work ahead. As Kush noted, uh, Cheryl Treadwell will be joining us for that forum. Um, we will be sending out registration for information for that um, in the near future. So just look for that in your inbox. And finally, the recording and resources will be available within the next two days, both in your inbox and on our website. So make sure that you are watching for that as well as our next issue of Caltrain Connect. Uh, if you have any questions, as always, don't hesitate to reach out to us, and we look forward to seeing you all in November.